Mississippi. From the Foundation Studio right here on Biloxi's Back Bay, I want to welcome you to Super Talk Outdoors, where we celebrate every single Monday the, at lunchtime the world-class outdoors of the state of Mississippi. Because as I say every week, we are the capital of the outdoors in America. I want to thank you for joining us on the powerful Super Talk Mississippi Radio Network. There's nothing like it in the entire United States. Uh, on the Super Talk TV at C Spire TV. But if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook or your favorite podcast, uh, you know, it's important to know the date. It is May the 15th, 2023. Uh, I especially want to thank the foundation, the sponsor of Super Talk Outdoors. The foundation is focused on important issues about protecting Mississippi's outdoors heritage. Hey, listen, I ran across something the other day, and it actually made me chuckle. I, I shared it on my uh, show on the coast we called the Ricky Matthews show and it's uh it was kind of funny I actually did a little research about it because I was curious curious who said this and um, and I think when you hear it you're going to say there's a lot of truth to that but here's what it said it has has beautiful mountains in the background incidentally and here's here's what the what the saying says the closer you are to nature the further you are from idiots <laughs> <laughs> it just made me chuckle, but come on now, you you know that too. Uh, the, you know the the, the the reality is the closer we are to the outdoors, the closer we are to gratitude. I'm actually profoundly honored and and uh, have gratitude that I get to spend time here on Super Talk Outdoors every Monday with so many dedicated people who are close to nature from the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. Now, they deeply covet the outdoors, and, and they're dedicated their lives. They've co completely dedicated their lives to protecting and conserving the resources here in Mississippi that we're all so fortunate to enjoy. And they educate. And from time to time, they lose sleep. They, they do lose sleep when special interests and politics try to change things in a way that's not good for the majority of Mississippians. But that's one of the reasons Super Talk Outdoors is here. And I have, uh, I have the backs of the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. That is for sure. Um, by the way, my views are on, on this show are mine, not those of the foundation. So as, uh, as I said every week, you can count on me to say what needs to be said when it comes to conservation issues in this state. And I am thrilled to be able to do that. Hey, listen, there's a new conservation raffle that's coming out from the foundation that is incredible. A lot of ma amazing uh, prizes. There's going to be tremendous amount of money raised for to support wildlife conservation in this state. At the beginning of the second half, I'll give you some of the breakdown of what that's all about. So without any further ado, let's move over to my friend, my dear friend, who I've worked with in the community for more years than I, I care to remember. Uh, Joe Spragans, uh, retired Brigadier General, United States Air Force, and now the Executive Director of the Mississippi Department of Marine Resources. Joe, how you doing, my friend? I'm good. How are you, Ricky? I'm doing really, really good. Hey, listen, I was thrilled to see that the Department of Marine Resources is going to be brought underneath the umbrella now of the, the foundation. So this is a 5013C uh, foundation that provides financial opportunities for organizations like Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks, like the Department of Marine uh, Fisheries and Marine Resources. Um, and it's, I, mean, I think it's going to be terrific that you're going to be involved in it. So congratulations on getting put underneath that umbrella. Well, it was a, it was a great honor to be able to uh, put the department. You know, we had a uh, foundation at one time that did not uh, operate the way it should. And uh, so we wanted to be able to look at it. We needed a foundation of some sort, of some way to operate. And uh, talked with the uh, group from uh, Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks Foundation. And uh, once we sat down and discussed what DMR and what the Marine Resources side of it would do, they were very appreciative and, uh, you know, opened their arms and, and said, come on in. We, you know, we think we would uh, have a great time together. And I think it'll be a great uh, partnership. I think we'll work together. We'll work hand in hand. Um, the one thing that they were missing is that. Yeah. You know, yeah. When you think of a wildlife foundation, the one thing they were missing was Department of Marine Resources. And so now we can do a lot of saltwater and other things that are going on. And, uh, you know, they do a lot of saltwater uh, as far as, uh, you know, when they do their shows, they would go out and go uh, speckle trout or snapper fishing or something. And they do some of that, but uh, this way we can be able to do some others. And uh, the other thing is to educate a lot of people. We want to educate a lot of people on marine resources, and they can do it. We can do it through fundraising and all to be able to do that, which I couldn't do as a department. And they yeah. can do it as a foundation. And uh, maybe even 
they to talk we might even have a governor's fishing tournament you know so that, would that be awesome i mean that 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 would be that we 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 actually need to do that 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 is for sure you know you see i talk about it almost weekly on the show that mississippi is the capital of the outdoors in america because you think about hunting in the mississippi delta or just canoeing down you know pascula river the largest undammed waterway in, in america or you know, you name it, um, we have the opportunity to really enjoy the outdoors. But when you add the coast to that, the barrier islands and the backwaters of, of coastal Mississippi and the ability for us to leave here and go go tuna fishing and marlin fishing right here from the Mississippi Gulf Coast, when you add up all those attributes together, it, that's why I say it's the capital of the outdoors in America. And the foundation is is doing multiple things. They're, they're helping to supply money that, that so to, to put in the gaps that, in the case of the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks, and now the Department of Marine Resources, allow you to do some projects you may not have otherwise been able to do. They're deeply, as you pointed out, deeply engaged in education across the spectrum, but especially as it, as it relates to youth, bringing youth into the outdoors. And what a great opportunity for the Department of Marine Resources to, to reach out and, and continue to find ways to get young people involved in the outdoors in Mississippi. But when you think about all this now being put together, um, they're covering all the spectrums now. They've got it from, from the coast to, to the far, farthest reach of the state north. And, uh, and now um, they can, they can, they can serve in, in a very, very more complete way. And I love the idea of doing some kind of a governor's fish fishing you said rodeo or whatever but it would be a lot of fun wouldn't it it would be and um and you know other things is uh i, I was meeting with don brazil uh the uh, executive director for the foundation uh, this past week and uh we were just talking about you know there's a lot of things uh, we could be able to uh have something for maybe teach ki children how to fish you know do some other things like they do with wildlife we do uh with hunting and other things and uh we could also uh, maybe have some scholarships, get into some scholarships and uh, be able to have uh, young men and women go into school to be able to come into marine resources and be able to do biological resources and all. So I think that's great. I think I, I think it's a great marriage, and, uh, if you want to call it or whatever you want to call it, but I, I'm just honored to be a part. And, uh, you know, DMR is honored to be a part. The governor was on board with no problem. And then we're just honored for, that they would be willing to let us be a part of it. Hey, listen, Joe, one thing we ought to do for people who live in the northern part of the state who are not familiar with the Department of Marine Resources, even though we've shared some of that here on this show before, they may have missed that. Let's remind people what the Department of Marine Resources is. Well, we're here to enhance, protect, and conserve the natural resources of the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, our job is to be able to make sure that we protect the resources that are there. We have to look at our, our seashore. And so how do we protect it? How do we, uh, you know, we're losing 200, about 200 acres a, a year and, uh, you know, just off of the coast itself, that's just uh, basically eroding. So what do we do? We got to go back and rebuild it. We got to find ways to make it say uh, where it's at. We have to take care of the resource and make sure that our oyster shrimp or uh, crab, you know, our fish are there. We want to, for your great, great grandkids to be able to have a place to fish and enjoy life. And we want to protect that. We protect the islands. We protect the uh, resources that are there. And the other thing is we have marine resource, uh, but marine patrol that we want to protect you. And we want to make sure that you're safe on the water. We want to make sure that you have everything and you do the things right. And that everyone is safe and can enjoy themselves. That's a, the meat of it. Hey, listen, uh, I, w I took my family, I have a large family, in my boat over to watch the uh, the jet display during during the uh, Keesler Field process, the Thunderbirds, as you know, were there. It was awesome. I, we we anchored just a little bit south of the Beau Rivage, and the and the jets were flying right over the uh, over our boat. It was just incredible. What a what a wonderful opportunity to see the power of the of the uh, U.S. military to go watch something like the Thunderbirds. But on the way back. Um, lots and lots and lots of boats. And of course, I had a, quite a few people on my boat. I don't know, 15, 16 people. And um, a Marine Patrol came came up and we slowed down. I put it in neutral. And uh, they said, hello, how you doing? And they just wanted to make sure that we had enough life jackets in the boat to cover everyone that was in the boat. And we obviously did that. And uh, But man, the thing that I noticed about them is they were extremely courteous. They were 
they were just terrific. And I didn't, I didn't introduce myself to them or anything like that. I didn't, I didn't say that I had this. Show. I just, I, I, I'm, I'm a citizen, and I take it like everybody else takes it. I, I'm very legal, by the way. I don't do anything illegal when I'm in my boat because I think voter safety is something none of us can take for granted. But um, two guys on their boat, and they were, again, incredibly professional. And once again, a great reminder. In fact, I was out boating yesterday and saw a couple of other guys out, out and about. And a boat had actually gotten in trouble and needed to get, be towed. And they were helping the, the folks through that process. But we're lucky to have them on the, on the backwaters and offshore uh, uh, here in coastal Mississippi, man. The, the, the uh, Department of Marine Resources and their officers are really important to boater safety. Hey, when we come back on the other side, we'll continue our conversation with Joe Spragans, the executive director of the Department of Marine Resources. We'll see you after this. Mississippi. Leading the conversation on Mississippi's outdoors. It's Super Talk Outdoors with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi. Mississippi. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors. We have my friend Joe Spragans, who's the executive director of the Bureau uh, Department of Marine Resources. And look, what's interesting about Joe, I, I've said this before, but for people who may have missed the previous times that we've talked, he's a cat with like 20 lives, not nine lives, 20 lives, because he has re- uh, stated his career more times than I can actually remember, but uh, he had tremendous responsibilities for the National Guard here in uh, Mississippi, and then he had uh, responsibility for emergency services at, before and after uh, Katrina for Harrison County. What an incredible role he played there. And, uh, you know, he's been out in private practice. Now he's the head of the Department of Marine Resources, and I, I joked with him the last time we were on the show together that uh, he could have retired a long, long, long time ago. And, you know, you can remind people what you said then, but what keeps you going, Joe? Well, I, I like to get up every morning and have a challenge. And that's uh, that's the biggest thing. I see a lot of people in my life, especially my military friends, that just retire and go home and uh, don't live very long. And yeah. uh, so I want something to keep me busy. And uh, plus, I got another thing. You know, if I stay at home every day, I got to work for my wife for free and do something I don't want to do. <laughs> I get. I really get that. Hey, listen. When I retired back in 2016, our friend John Harrison, uh, who, who, as Joe knows, is chairman and uh, CEO of the of Hancock Whitney, really close friend of mine. He said, "Okay, what are you going to do now, Ricky?" And I said, "I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to fish and hunt and join my grandkids." And he just laughed out loud. It took about four years, and uh, Super Talk folks came to me, and one thing led to another. I still consider myself retired, but I really do enjoy doing my show on the coast and doing Super Talk Outdoors because I really enjoy uh, celebrating the outdoors in Mississippi. And, I, you know, it's been an honor for me to be able to do that. But Joe, John was right, Joe. I wasn't going to be able to stay away very long. And it's um, the one thing I enjoy most about being a publisher is the, the ability to connect with the community, the, the ability to, to help move things along in our state. And and then in my small way with my two shows now, I have that opportunity to do that. Hey, listen, one other thing before we move on from the law enforcement part of what the Department of Marine Resources does. You know, Joe, one of the things that's very clear to me, the number of boats on the water in coastal Mississippi has gone up tremendously. I see more sea dews and and jet skis, and I've seen in a long, long, long time. The other thing I see more of, unfortunately, is more drinking, drinking and boating. And th that's got to give you guys major concern that we, that some people are not putting safety first. It does. And, uh, you know, we try everywhere in the world, and we try to get people to encourage them to understand that, they, you know, it's just like in a car or anything else, you know, you don't want to be drinking excessively and then, uh, you know, on a boat because it impairs how you operate it. Uh, we try to work with them. We try to do the best we can to help them. Uh, they sum it just like any other times, you know, it's just not going to happen. And, uh, you know, things get uh, out of hand and uh, we, we have to do what we have to do. But uh, Marine Patrol is trying hard. And, uh, you know, and if they see somebody and they think that they're, they're doing it, they'll try to help them. They'll try to get them to work it out, you know, and get somebody on the boat that'll drive the boat and make them drive it to a straight place. They'll do everything they can. You know, they're going to do everything they can to help you before they have to do what they do. But uh, but if you're a danger to the people, if you're any type of danger to the people on the border, then we're going to do our job. Yeah, and you have to. Boater safety. As we know, when there's a 
serious accident here in coastal Mississippi, when it involves a boat, it too often involves a fatality, and and we have to stop that. I mean, there, the water is unforgiving if someone is unconscious and goes into the water. It's just, and and obviously, if we not if we don't have personal flotation devices the way the law requires us to have. But uh, safety first, I, I talk about it almost all the time here on this show. And, you know, whether we're talking about the, the lakes of Mississippi or here on the coast, uh, boater safety is it has to always be a primary concern. And that's for everyone in the boat, not just the person operating the boat. So if you're, you're in a boat and the person operating the boat is drinking, then it's your responsibility to say something. It's your, your, your impro- responsibility to do something so that you can make sure that the people in the boat Remain safe. I mean, that, I can't. I can't really state that enough. Hey, Joe, another area that you guys say grace over is shrimping season. Um, what's the current state of affairs as it relates to this this coming season? Uh, it's looking real good. It's uh, they're they're moving up to around a 68 count right now, so that's getting into the number that we like to have around 60. So we're good. Uh, I think that uh, we have a meeting. Matter of fact, after this uh, uh, show with you, and uh, we're going to have a meeting and talk about it. And uh, we might open up uh, next week. Even. You know, it, it, it might we might open a little early. I don't know. Just uh, just guessing on it. I think that uh, we're looking at it. But we'll definitely be open before the first of, uh, G- of June. But uh, I think we may open in time, and uh, that'll be great. The uh, the biggest part, if we open too early next week, we're going to miss the blessing of the fleet. You know, and, <laughs> you know, they'll open before the blessing of the fleet. So we'll have to look at that too. You know, and um, I think that's set up for Memorial Weekend. Uh, you know, to do it. And so uh, we'll definitely, you know, whatever's good for the uh, industry. We don't want to wait too late to open because the shrimp will move out and we want the smaller boats to be able to catch some. Yes. Blessing of the fleet. What a great, what a great uh, part of our heritage here in coastal Mississippi. What a, what a wonderful event that is every year as as the uh, Bishop or the Monsignor from St. Michael's is there to to bless the the uh, the, the the shrimp fleet. Uh, in fact, uh, Monsignor Dominic Fulham is my priest at St. Michael's, where I where I go to church, and the Bishop of the Diocese of Biloxi is a really really close friend of mine. He actually fishes with me, Joe. Uh, he loves to fish, Good. and he can't he can't get enough. And and the, the the arrangement that we have, and he just lives right around the corner from me. But um, but when when he's available, he just sends me a text, and if I'm at the house, we'll go jump in the boat and go have a little bit of fun, you know, running around the house, or, you know, here close to the house, catch some redfish and specks, and that's just kind of the the running agreement that we have. And when we're on the boat, I might add that, you know, you would think, what do you what do you talk about when you're with the bishop? I mean, what what kind of conversations do you have? Um, well, it might surprise you to learn that we don't talk about religion or politics or even current events we talk about boy wasn't that fish awesome <laughs> isn't that bird beautiful i mean we just enjoy nature together and uh it's a good relief for me and it's a great relief for him as well but but the, but the shrimp season is is part of man there are there are lots it's an economic value for coastal mississippi obviously as we well know but a lot of families depend on you guys getting that right don't they they do and um you know, and as I said, uh, you know, the full moon or anything else can change the shrimp and move it. The, the tide can move it. So we have to be very careful. And the guys and uh, ladies and gentlemen in DMR that work that every day, they watch every second of it. And they're on it. And uh, as I said, they're meeting right now or when we'll be meeting after this. And I think that uh, they want to move quickly because they don't want to see them go out because they will move out. They'll move out yeah. quickly. It's been, it's, you know, what has been. We've talked about this on the show. It's been more of a normal spring, you know, yeah. so, some, you know, some cool days and some hot days, you know, rain, but not too much rain. It's been kind of a normal spring, which is really good for shrimp season, isn't it? It is. It's wonderful, and uh, so I think we'll have a good uh, shrimp season this year, and uh, hopefully, uh, everything will work out. Hey, Joe, in the short time we have left, uh, what's the what's the main thing on your mind these days? Well, we got a, one of my biggest issues is snapper. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the uh, I, Noah has cut us back this year to 60, a little over 62,000 pounds, in which they're going to try to give us a little bit extra, you know. But uh, the problem is that it's, uh, it's all working off of antiquated systems. It is. It and, is. You know, when you say that we sell 80,000 license a year, and we're going to, and so the people in North Mississippi hunt, they take fish every day. 
a snapper season, it's not going to happen. You know, they got over 500 miles to fish. They're not going to do it at 400. And uh, so the uh, the issue is uh, they don't have them. We have the best system in the world, tails and scales. And they just, they're, they're trying to get it, but uh, it just seems like that uh, they, they're having a hard time going past the thing to say that this is what we got it here by and we're, not, and we're going to stay. So it's probably going to force us to do something we don't want to do. And that's that we'll probably come out from under Noah. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and the state legislature has given me the money to do it and that we will do our own and we will manage our own. And, uh, and that's what Louisiana and that's what Texas does. And it works great for them. And I uh, just thank the legislature and everybody for giving me the opportunity to be able to do that. I hate to do it because I'd rather stay in the system and work it, but, uh, Unless they can show us something, we're probably going to have to do that. And when we do that, then we'll be able to manage our own resources. Hey, but Joe, you know what's interesting? I go back. Of course, I was the publisher of the Mobile Press Register, and I was also the publisher in New Orleans at the Times Picayune, and then longtime publisher here at the Sun Herald. If I had to think about besides insurance, besides insurance, and I'll make that clear, the 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 other issue that we wrote the most about was red snapper. I mean, and I would I would expect Alabama. I don't know what their current plans are, but certainly back then, they're they they were looking seriously at doing what you're talking about. Mississippi is going to do now, but Alabama is it just drives them crazy. Look at the number of artificial reefs that Alabama has off its shore, and there's absolutely no sign that that there's a the depletion of the resource in any way. If, in, if anything, it's the best it's ever been. That's what we see in Mississippi as well, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And just look at Louisiana. Just because it gave them all the extra, they having to go three fish a day just to be able to catch it uh, per person, you know. So, I mean, yeah. no, nah, it's it, it's there. If we thought we was hurting anything, we'd do different, but we're not. Joe, we're out of time, but it, we'll, we'll come back together again and talk more about the snapper because that's an interesting subject that all Mississippians, especially those who come down here to go fishing, might want to learn more about. Anyway, this has been Joe Spragans, Executive Director of the Department of Marine Resources. When we come back, we'll continue the conversation. We'll see you after this. I really enjoyed that conversation t with uh, Joe uh, Spragans, and, and welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors. He's the executive director of the Department of Marine Resources, and uh, super dedicated. It's great to have them underneath the foundation umbrella now, and uh, you know the, the foundation is even more complete and, and more influential than ever as a result of that. Hey, real quick, the conservation raffle that I mentioned at the beginning of the a show is a great opportunity for outdoor enthusiasts to win some really big prizes for the good of conservation in the state. So the Ralpha offers five big time in, uh, prizes. One is a $50,000 Ford vehicle voucher. Another is a Legends Hunt with with uh, our friend Cuz Strickland and, and Preston Pittman, an Argentina dove hunt for eight, a 10-day guided African safari, or the ultimate outdoors package filled with amazing uh, items. Uh, but, but obviously, by participating and having the opportunity to win these great prizes, you're you're really participating in helping protect uh, Mississippi's outdoors heritage for for many generations to come. So ticket prices are twenty dollars each, three for fifty, ten for one hundred twenty-five tickets for one hundred fifty dollars. You can go to mwfp mwfp dot foundationraffle dot com, or you can just do a search on it and you'll find it. Uh, the, the last day to buy a ticket is July the 30th. The drawing is going to be on August the 14th at the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. And uh, it's going to be a really important raffle for uh, the outdoors in this state. So look it up and, uh, and get your ticket. Get your ticket and a chance to win a big one. Anyway, with, uh, with the focus on Mississippi Museum of Natural Science, I'm really thrilled to have my friend, uh, Nicole Smith back. She is a project specialist at the M Mississippi Museum of Natural Science, and she's been on the show three or four times. I really enjoy the time that I have with uh, with Nicole. So how you doing, my friend? I'm fabulous. Thanks for asking. How are you? <laughs> it's good to see you. Listen, we were chatting before, the, before we started that there is always something going on. You're either in the midst of, a, of, a, of an exhibit, bringing one in, to send them one out and bring it, you know, you, you've got a lot going on there, don't you? Yeah, until that cloning project comes through, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm going to be a little bit too busy, but yeah, it's a good problem to have. 
It, no, it is, it is a great it is a great problem to have. So as you guys look forward to the kids getting out of school and doing your what you're so dedicated to, which is to bring uh, a, 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 the joy of nature and the outdoors to kids. Uh, I bet you guys have a heavy, heavy agenda going forward. We do uh, summer camps coming up uh, and our, all of our camps are almost full. So, you know, we actually start taking registration in um, March 1st. So you can tell that that's, that's action packed, though we do have some specialty camps and you can see them on our website and register for them. Uh, we've got that. We've got one exhibit leaving that's packed. They're packing it up today from here to there, which we loved. It was a physics uh, exhibit. It was here for like six months. The kids played, the adults had fun. It was wonderful. And now we're getting ready for our new exhibit, Permian Monsters. So this is a life before the dinosaurs, and we are nerding out pretty hard down here and in a good way, so it's great. <laughs> hey, when you and I talked about the physics um, display that was going to be out, you know, done, um, you had big hopes for it. You, you, you knew that this sort of experiential learning opportunity was going to be a, a big one. Sounds like it turned out to be terrific. Oh, it was fantastic. I mean, how many times do you get to sit in a hovercraft and go around and then learn what that means about coefficients of friction? I mean, that's awesome. That's just, that's a great day. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is awesome. And tell me more about the, up, the upcoming, the one that you'll be unpacking and, and setting up. Sure. So a lot of people know about dinosaurs, but they don't really know about life before the dinosaurs. Uh, the Permian is a millions of years before we get anywhere near a dinosaur, and this is all the great, 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 great grandcestors to that which would come. Uh, so we're talking about uh, proto-reptiles, para-amphibians, the synapsids, which were the animals that eventually would become the relatives of mammals. So we're looking at like a great deal of variety, and this has original fossil specimens, this has animatronics, it's a mind-bogglingly huge exhibit. It's going to take up most of the um, museum. Uh, we're going to have way too much fun with this because um, this is the Permo, uh, the Permian extinction is the biggest extinction in the history of the world. 90% uh, of all life that was documented at the time uh, went extinct. And that which survived became ultimately the ancestors of all which remained. So it's kind of... Um, it's an interesting time. It's diverse. There's some uh, great things we can do with volcanoes. Uh, it, I don't know. We're going to have a blast with it. No pun intended with one volcanoes of the, what, and blast. But. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry to mean to step on you. The, the, the thing that's interesting to me when I think about the dinosaurs is when you put them within the context of time and where they were in time. So that's, that's actually an important part of an exhibit like this, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Like dinosaurs are only. Um, Around 65 million years ago, you know, that's about the last time we really get dinosaurs. Uh, the Permian, we're talking about 200 million years before that. So we're talking about a really great period of time between. Uh, and, and timing's everything. Think when you got early to a party or late to a party. You either got there when it was getting kicked off or it was ending. It, it kind of matters when you arrive. <laughs> Hey, so listen, let's take a step back for a second and remind people, we're, we're going to be, we're actually, we're going to come to this in a second, the Moonlight Music and Meteors event that, that we want to talk about. But what, you know, in your job, just describe your job to the general public, what it is you do and, and why you love it so much. My background is actually in geology and anthropology. So I had been doing uh, some work, some research with that, and I ended up in education. And I kind of love that because I got to share everything I love uh, with people who are willing to listen to it for whatever crazy reason. And uh, so now what I do is create events that have an educational focus, uh, but we do it in a playful way. So my motto is a little science, a lot of fun. And I feel like if you have a really great experience and you learn one, even if it's just one little thing, the next time I see you, you came back, you wanted to learn something new. And so we kind of add to that. And there's a lot of different ways uh, to do that. So there's all different types of learners, and we try to reach anyone and everyone in the most accessible way that we can. That That is so cool. And incidentally, War Eagle. <laughs> she uh, spent some time at the University of Auburn, uh, Auburn University, where my, my son went to school. Oh, 
And uh, in fact, my wife and I and all my kids, except for one, went to Southern Miss. Okay. And Justin was going to be the outlier, so he went to university. He went to Auburn University and loved it. It prepared him extremely well. We spent an awful lot of time there while he was there, just soaking up that beautiful campus and enjoying it there. But you, you have a good time there? I did. I learned a lot. Um, I think I'm very blessed in that I had exceptional professors and I got to study a lot. Of, I have a lot of minors just because I'm that nerd and I, I'm like, oh, this looks interesting. And I decided to take some extra classes. But yeah, so I get to use all of it now. So that's kind of great. <laughs> yeah, he was he was very well prepared. He actually works in New York City now for Price Waterhouse. Oh. And, um, and he looks back at his education at Auburn with incredible... Um, he's, he was honored to go there, but he was incredibly prepared uh, when he got into the real world. So I think, you know, it's good to feel that way about your school, and it's great to feel that way about your education, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. So tell me about the inspiration for Moon. Well, first of all, let's talk about Moonlight Music and Meteors, and then we'll talk about the inspiration for it. But what is it? Okay, I can't stop smiling when I talk about it because it's this exciting to me. Um, last summer, we had this really incredible exhibit called Space, A Journey to the Future. And uh, we did a lot of trainings with uh, NASA specialists, including those that uh, coordinate the education from the James Webb Space Telescope. And we made a lot of new connections and created lots of different types of programs throughout the duration of that event, that exhibit. That started to live in my brain a little longer than usual to the point where I was dreaming, truly literally dreaming about space at night. And one of the dreams I had involved music. I woke up and I'm like, oh, that's a great idea for an event. <laughs> We need to have a music event and we need to relate it to astronomy. And um, so I started looking into it and uh, the Mississippi Symphony Orchestra uh, was very patient with me as they tried to school me on what I needed to uh, learn to host a symphony event. And we found a grant and that uh, has got from the Mississippi Arts Commission. So we're very blessed that they uh, sponsored this. They decided to fund this as a project and, uh, and also National Endowment for the Arts. So it's some partial funding that way. And as a result, um, we're able to host this beautiful thing. I had all these great um, solar system ambassadors. NASA's um, volunteer educators are called the solar system ambassadors. And we've got at least three joining us uh, for the night of the event. And uh, we even have, believe it or not, Best Buys coming out because they sell telescopes. So they're going to bring some of their telescopes to demonstrate. And if you're uh, like really committed to buying them, you can do that too. Uh, but it's a great event. And hey, hey, Nicole, let's do this. Hold your thought right where you are right there. And we'll continue to talk about this new event, Moonlight Music and Meteors. I love the name, incidentally. We'll, we'll talk more about how that got named here in just a second. But when we when we get on the other side, we'll continue our conversation with Nicole Smith. And for, she, she works with the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. And we'll see you after this. We live in one of the best places in America to enjoy the outdoors. So let's talk about it. It's Super Talk Outdoors with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors for the final segment. I always enjoy my time with Nicole Smith. I, honestly, I enjoy my time with every single person that I have the opportunity to visit with weekly from the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. And, and as I said, I, with a lot of gratitude, so much gratitude, and I'm honored to have this opportunity to to chat with them and um, and to talk about how their passion for nature and the outdoors is literally a, a life's mission for them. I mean, that's that's that describes you, right? I mean, you're it's a life mission for you, isn't it, Nicole? Yeah, it's not a job; it's a calling. Absolutely. Well, when you dream, when you dream about space <laughs> as a result of something that happens in your job, and then that evolves to a discussion about an event that could involve space and music, and then you start to become a bit of an orchestra 
uh, event uh, expert as a result of your, your research, and then you ultimately came to this name of this event, Moonlight Music and Meteors. What a beautiful name. Oh, I love the name. <laughs> thank you. Uh, the original date for the event was supposed to be April the 21st, and we selected that for a couple of reasons, but the main one was because it was for the Lyrid Meteor Shower. So we were kind of excited about it. We figured out that the symphony would begin playing right at sunset, you know, and then we would kind of conclude with the last notes of the performance ending at about the time that we need to make everything dark because um, light can interfere with sky viewing. So we were going to go completely blank and then we were going to start viewing the lyrics. Well, uh, the rain had a better plan, and so we had to <laughs> reschedule it, so we rescheduled it to Sunday. Well, then the weather had a different plan, and it dropped the temperature below 65, which means symphony instruments do not play. So then we changed the day, and it's this Friday, May 19th. Great, great. Uh, we, don't, we don't have a meteor shower now, um, and it's a new moon, which means it's very dark but that's actually kind of cool for night viewing. And uh, if we're lucky, we might have a view of the Coma Cluster, cluster which is a collection of uh, galaxies. And I don't know, with Jackson's night sky, I don't know how well we'll get to see it, but we're going to have some super fancy telescopes out there, so hopefully we'll see a little something. That, that is so cool. Listen, i tell you just a quick story. About two days after Hurricane Katrina, we still had no power, of course. And my sons and I walked out, and it was just pure devastation around us. And But my son, Justin, was looking up into the sky. And he looked at me and he said, Dad, what is it about Hurricane Katrina that made the stars so bright? And I explained to him that, you know, you're not used to seeing the sky from here without all this interference of the light and whatever. But to, you know, when you can bring it down to real darkness and then see, look up into a clear sky and see the brilliance of space... Um, it is it is it is transformative, and for him it was, and my other son as well, J Jordan. It was a it, they just peered up and said, "My gosh, we never realized it was so like this." And we stood out there with this devastation around us, and saw this incredible, divine you know moment that we were having. Uh, it's beautiful to be able to have those moments, isn't it? It is. Um, my screen just went blank on my computer. Hang on. <laughs> That's the problem. Uh, it is. It's wonderful. And it, it is a challenge to see uh, the night sky in the city. And it's because of uh, a term that's called light pollution. You know, everything from leaving your porch light on at night to street lights, that, that can be an issue. And it's kind of a hard thing to get around. Um, and we realize that there are going to be challenges with that in this uh, new performance venue called The Den. It's uh, right by that new fancy playground you've seen. And um, this is the inaugural concert event in this space. We've never tried anything exactly like it before. Uh, but to help with the night sky viewing, um, there, is, there are going to be two particular points in the evening where everything goes dark. And we'll give, you know, all the audience a heads up on how to respond and what to do. Um, we will also have, oh, I got it right here. <laughs> this is so cute. Now, this is what I call the egg. Mm -hmm. uh, it sort of looks pinkish on the screen, but it's actually a, a shade of red. And when you're doing night sky viewing, if you need light, you need a red light because it, the wavelengths do not interfere with how you perceive um, night, the night sky. It's not going to blind you temporarily before you have to go looking at something. So all of our uh, special exhibitors that are coming, our solar system ambassadors, uh, a couple of uh, astronomers, a physicists, those that are coming, they're going to have these at their stations and they'll be turned on when it's time to go visit them. So that's kind of Nicole, cool. let's do this. That's this Friday night where we're running out of time. So the Moonlight Music and Meteors event, if they want to get tickets, they can go to the MW, mdwfp.com slash museum or just do a search. Probably the quickest way to get there is Moonlight Music and Meteors. How much are the tickets? So right now they're $15 until noon on Thursday and then at the door, the door, you know, the, the event site, uh, $20. Things you need to know, bring a chair, 
or bring a blanket. We will have a concessionaire there. Pig and Pint's going to be there selling food. There's lots of parking. There will be a security directing people on where to park, things to know. And um, have a good time. <laughs> That's it. Hey, this has been Nicole Smith uh, from the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Have a great day and stay safe in the outdoors. We'll see you later.